It's November 4th, 2017. And we are meeting with me, Britt Trainer, and a number of friends, longtime residents of Bemis Point area. And we're at the Bemis Point Inn, which used to be trainers many years ago. And we're trying to recapture some of our youth memory, memories. And so we're gonna, it's a very casual discussion. Let's, let's introduce everybody so that, uh, for the record, don't know who's here. Uh, we'll start with. Okay, hi. Trainers. I'm Sarah Goebel, Sarah Trainer Goebel, and I'm my Brit's oldest daughter, only daughter, oldest daughter. And um, I grew up here at the restaurant, um, and I we moved from the back in into the upstairs when my parents bought it from my aunt and uncle, uh, Joe and Paul Winter, in uh, about 1962. And so we lived upstairs until we sold the, uh, the, the business to the Bonars, Jeannie and Bob Bonar, around 1978. I got to work here and live here, and uh, it was part of my growing up. I'm Karen Walsh from Bemis Point. I'm Bill Whitfield from Bemis Point. I grew up actually right across the street. And uh, <laughs> those old days were terrific over here. Because they made it a teen center uh, back around 1963 or 64. It was a, just a fantastic time over here. Uh, all those kids got in here and having hamburgers and milkshakes and everything. and Just getting together and it was great. And one other thing, uh, they acquired a piano, I guess. And I didn't know they acquired it for me. That's what you said, me, really, guess. And I sort of strolled over here and sort of punked on the piano quite a bit, playing a little boogie woogie all the time. So that really kind of caught my start in music, really. And after that, I just kept on getting uh, more adapted to music, and uh, I've been playing in bands for a long time. Thank you, Mary. Getting the piano. That's a good, that's a good piece of music. <laughs> yeah. And you, it, it, it paid off. It sure did. Yeah. With yeah. a lot of bands I've been in. A lot of bands, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm Mike Rogers, and I don't know why I have the honor of doing this, but it, it is a privilege to be here with Nate and your family. Uh, I spent a lot of time in trainers back in the yeah. in the fifties, <laughs> and I have a lot of fond memories of this place. And in addition to the table behind the camera, we have Nate son, Don Trainer. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce Johnson. I think I. Have known Maybrit longer than anybody here. I'm scanning everybody, and nobody remembers Maybrit like I do, <laughs> <laughs> because back in the up until about 1949, my family, brother, mother, and dad lived on the Bemis Creek on the upper side, this side, and Maybrit. And her brother and mother and father lived on Bemis Creek on that side. So we could talk to each other right. just by going to the creek's edge and letting each other know how we were. <laughs> now I have a question for you, honey. I think you went to Sweden one time as an ambassador. What was that for? Well, it was uh, actually totally American ambassador. Oh. And uh, well, all of us who went, who were elected, uh, came from different parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember it being quite an honor for you to go. Well, it was. Yeah. What, do you remember when that would have been? Maybe around 1943, 44. Uh -huh. so was it during the war? Yeah. Yeah. But I remember you making your trip. Right? Yes. Yeah. yes. And I had so much fun because I... All I did was talk about school and my friends here, and you know, and the Swedes all wanted to know about you. And uh, it, it was a wonderful vacation because, in my mind, I had not had, uh, well, I was probably a junior in high school 
when I became aware of the fact that I had Swedish relations. It was wonderful. And then comes the news that we are going to Sweden to meet the Swedish people. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine what a joy that is? Mm -hmm. What? You there know, would have been something. Your yeah. own blood. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and how they were. Do they speak Swedish or is there anything in English? Oh dear. What am I going to do? You, know? but, oh, you did it. it you wonderful. did it. it God bless you, honey. It was wonderful. Yeah. I'm going to ask you where you were born. No. Oh. You, you, yes. I was born in a little village called Lowell, Derrick. And that's in the uh, very, very close on the border mm -hmm. of Sweden and. and uh, Norway? Yes. Norway. Thank you. Yeah. And oh, I didn't know what life was without people all around. And there were English people. They, they were there. How did they get there? I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, it was wonderful. I heard, I heard you called Maybrit and Mybrit. Yeah. And, and tell us what it actually is. Is it Maybrit or Mybrit? It Mybrit? is my Brit. And that's the Swedish pronunciation. Spelled? I didn't know that. Same thing. M A J. J, yes. M A J. My Brit. Yes, and Brit is capital B R I T T. Very good. And the my is the word for May in, in Swedish. Yes. Oh. She was born May 7th, and so her name is her birth date. Her birth month, so it's my my Brit. Thank you. Huh. And how how did how did you and Point meet? Oh. And, what, and, and then just follow that up and tell us how you met, and then how you ended up with Beamer's Point. Well, I'll tell you. Meeting Don was Point was uh, that that was his nickname, Point. Everybody called him Pint. You're right. No one called him Don. No. <laughs> so where did you meet him? At the restaurant. Right here? Oh, really? Is this the restaurant? Yes. Oh, yes. my goodness. It doesn't look like it now. That's no. why, That's why. yeah, I, if I came in here now, I would be a little confused, too. Bless your heart. Yeah. I forgot. Hey, Mom. Oh, wonderful. Do you remember, um, I remember you telling us a story about how when um, Toby, your younger, your brother, was growing up, and you lived down on the Bemis Creek across from the Johnsons, Bruce Johnson's family, you would come and you'd bring Toby up here for ice cream Sundays on the weekends in the summer. And Toby used to think it was because you liked him so much and you wanted to treat him to ice cream until he figured out you were really more interested in the guy behind the counter who was serving the ice cream <laughs> named Don. I love it. Oh, that is, that's a great example. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you, can't, you can't hide it anymore. No. <laughs> now my female program is over. <laughs> Everybody knows about Don. <laughs> but that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. He's wonderful. Yeah. Well, do, do you know how he got his nickname, Pint? Does anybody know? I don't. Sarah? Um, my, my dad was a shorty. He was um, very small and skinny growing up. And um, so they always called him Pint. And then my brother, Lee, who was also a bit of a runt, uh, they called Half Pint. <laughs> so, um, so it was. It was actually in school, in high school. Yeah, it? probably elementary school. Oh, he, um, he, his, uh, uh, my grandma and grandpa, um, Ruby Pearl and uh, Leon Trainer, um, moved from Jamestown to this site 
around 1928, and my dad was about eight years old, he said, when they moved up here to Bemis. And so I'm guessing it was all of his buddies. They all had nicknames. Oh, yes. All the kids oh, had nicknames. Had nicknames yeah. And growing up, I remember him talking about oh. this one or that one, and it was never by their real name. It was always their nickname. So I, he just got half pint, or he got pint. pint yeah. yeah, he got pint. <laughs> well, I, I had other ideas, but I never knew them. <laughs> Uh, well, everybody in Bemis Point has a nickname. Oh, that, yes. That's just the way it is. Yeah. And you carry that forever. Forever. You know? You know. I know. Yeah. You've been Leon. Like uh, forever, forever. forever. Yeah. I don't know how I got it either. Yeah. No one calls you Billy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Very few people call me Bill. Yeah. In fact, uh, they would say, your name is Bill? <laughs> I thought we saw it was Leon. I go, well, yeah. that's my nickname. <laughs> Yeah, that's really something, because all of my cousins had nicknames, they still got them. It's unbelievable. Now, the, the restaurant was called Trainers. Was that the original name of the restaurant? The, uh, did, did Pint's dad start the restaurant? Oh, yeah. Okay. And yeah. yeah, his name, what was his name? Liam. 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 Or Liam. Liam. That's probably where he got his name. L E O N. There is actually a town, Leon. That little Leon. kid across the road back where he belongs, <laughs> Leon. <laughs> and he built the cabins. Pardon? He built the cabins? Yes, and they, there was a big house out back here, too. It, uh, the, where this driveway is and where the, yeah. big, the new house is here now. And I'm not sure who built this building and that building, but at one time, Neighbor's in-laws lived in that building, and then, and then somewhere along the line, maybe neighbor can Sally can do better than I can. But along came Joanna, Pint's sister, married Paul Winter, so it became Trainer and no, Winter. I remember a while. Okay. Yeah, that. yeah. Um, dates, I, you know, I'm going back maybe to the 50s, somewhere in there. Oh, it was a lot yeah. earlier, actually. Um, well, yes, but... So, because um, my, my grandpa worked for the Empire Case Goods, and they began to lay people off prior to the Depression, to that crash and stuff. And so they decided to acquire the land here, and he even brought on other people that worked for him there that had lost their jobs, and they built the cabins. There were 21 cabins. There was the main house, which is where they lived. Um, there was a laundry, and there was a, a you know the, the pump room and all that stuff. Oh, why did we and then down? this yeah. building was um, you know just the basic mm -hmm. uh, cabin check-in, yeah. and, and they didn't really have food initially. So on a, a full night in the summer, we could sleep 72 people Whoa. in 1927, 1928, right around in there. Mm. Um, and then uh, they built a fruit stand around 1930 uh, here on the corner of Clifford and Maine. Um, and usually the tourists would come for like a month or more uh, and stay. Um, a lot of them came to go to the casino for the dances and the music. Big time. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. All those big dance bands and stuff. A lot of people were from Cleveland and Pittsburgh. That's where we got a lot of our um, uh, our tourists. Um, and then my Aunt Jo married her husband, Paul Winter, in 43. And that's when they added Trainer and Winter mm -hmm. cabins mm -hmm. and motel. I just want to, uh, Karen, I want you had you said that you had some kind of a, a connection with me, but as far as uh, the a AFS yes, program. Yes, I remember in high school that you were very active with the Swedish culture, but also very active with the American Field Service Exchange students. And I know that there was an active group in Bemis that met and supported the students that came and also uh, interviewed students who were uh, interested in studying abroad. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any recollection of some of those students. I am so sad to say that when you have a, a cluster of people <coughs> that adore you, you adore them, mm -hmm. and when they leave, you'll never see them again. Mm -hmm. 
because they are as we are. We have visited, we have loved, and we have uh, written to them, but then they go away to their homes. Mm -hmm. That's as far as, as I can tell you. Mm -hmm. And and of course, me too. Right. I went home. Mm -hmm. And but look at what I've been doing all these years. I've told them what wonderful people I met mm -hmm. and lived with. And that's that's the important part of traveling for young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we just had a, the best time. Well, and you were quite the ambassador here too to welcome many well, of the students and later. make them feel uh, at home yeah. and as if they had a friend and yes. someone that they could talk to and right. count on as well. Yes. And I think that's a wonderful uh, situation that any school should try to get into that program because it's so good for the student, so good. It's good for the student, it's good for our students too to meet people yes. from across the world because Absolutely. we live in such an insulated place That's with not right. much exposure to other people. So, so right. it opens up the world yes. and gives them a different perspective oh, and appreciation. Yes, and, and we're all so surprised when we hear somebody who's from Japan or you know, any anybody else, any anything else. And that oh, is that a creature who lives there? <laughs> That's the way we felt, you know. Well didn't you there were portraits? Most of them or all of the Not all of games. them. It uh Lura Bell Coburn um taught adult ed courses in the district for many years and she used the exchange students as models for uh, the adult ed classes so there were 18 portraits of some of the students that used to hang in the library yes and that's how I became involved again. When I was in high school, I was friends with some of the AFS students yes. and maintained, I've maintained those friendships over the years too. So um, I became involved again when one of my friends came back to visit 39 years after she was a student here. Oh, wow. And we went up to look at her portrait and, and um, that's how I became involved in that, so yes. They remodeled the library and they took them down because they were in the library for many years, for a couple of decades at least. Yes. And then they were put in a closet after the renovation of the library. Right. And when my friend Michiko from 1972 came back to visit six years ago, she wanted to see the school and her portrait. And so we went up to the school and they had the, we said, well, we're ready to go to the library now. And they said, oh, your portrait is right here and you can have it if you want. So I was quite surprised. Yes. Uh, but they were Wonderful. delighted. And then I thought, well, I'll get my friend Alice's portrait, since she was my friend too. And then when I saw that they were in that closet and not being uh, displayed, I thought, well, gosh, I'm going to ask for all those portraits and try to find the subjects and send them around the world. So they were appreciated yes. and they were viewed, and um, it's been quite the project. That's, you know, the idea is to that promote is. peace, and that's right. what it does. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. How about some of, the, some of the members in the restaurant or around the restaurant itself? I can remember your your dad, Mike. I think it was a huge Red Sox fan. And he and Jack Thompson both were Red Sox fans. And I was a Yankee fan. And Red Sox and Yankees are like oil and water. They just they don't mix. And we would get together and I of course the Yankees always won. <laughs> you know, they, they, the Red Sox never won, so and, and it was always fun to come in here and fight. I had to schedule up on something on the wall, a calendar with all the games. They write the scores in it. We always come in. I'd point to the scores, you know, 
And, 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 and poor Jack, he was a Red Sox fan. If anybody was a Red Sox fan, that was too bad. <laughs> but we, uh, Jack, speaking of Jack, and his brother Bruce, and Dave Evans, Dave Lipsy, and I don't know, my brother, I think you might even been involved. We played golf, couldn't be in, at night oh, yeah. after being playing golf all day, and then we would play golf at night, and we would formulate a game, and whoever won, whoever had the lowest score, would get treated to a milkshake and french fries at trainers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would we would come down here, and and the other, all the losers would chip in, and, and, and the winner would get. We called that the milkshake open. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yeah, another fellow played with us, Ray Schuessler. He was he, he came here in the summer. He was a writer, and he he uh, he called it the World Cereal of Golf. I don't know, how to it, but it was it was so much fun to to, to do that. And French fries at trainers were the best. They were the absolute <laughs> best. There's anywhere you go. Well, fries and, and one of the secrets of that was that we made our own french fries. In fact, in the space that we're sitting in right now, this was actually part of the back storeroom. And we had the potato peeler, which was a big round barrel that was yeah. electric. Oh, yeah. And yeah. right about here, and we used to bring the bags of potatoes in. Yeah and put them in the potato peeler and turn it on and it would peel them. And then there was a slicer, so we would feed it into the slicer and it would slice them and then they'd either go directly into the, um, the, the cooker for the uh, french fries or into the freezer in bags, uh, in portions. Yeah. And that's, that's how we did that. And I remember my mom and dad, every single Sunday night, they cleaned the grease. Um, there was fresh grease every week. Um, they, that, that was, was one of the secrets. Yeah, right that there. they they were you know very, and very we, um, my mom and uh, one of her specialties was uh, roast beef, and I can still remember the, the hot roast beef sandwiches, with mashed potatoes and gravy, and there were people that would come down on weekends from Buffalo just to have her. Roast beef oh boy. dinners. Yeah, all right. <laughs> You're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, in the summer, you know, with all the the summer people would come in, and um, they would um, have parties, and so they would call in an order, and it might come in at you know 11 o'clock in the morning for a one o'clock pickup for you know 12 milkshakes, 15 orders of French fries. 20 hamburgs, um, 10 hot dogs, and wow. so then they would get all that ready, and then whoever was picking it up would come in, maybe it was the paddocks, the, the guy that owns Zippo in uh, Bradford, I mean, we had a lot of people on the yeah. lake who had, you know, really you know, companies or a had a lot of money or whatever, and they would just have these big parties and we were the caterers. <laughs> Does anybody remember the first stool at the counter over by the clock? Everybody know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If you looked up in the ceiling, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about, Bill? I know what you're talking about. There was a hook eye up there, <laughs> and there was a string that came from the kitchen <laughs> out to that hook eye. And it would go down, and guess what was attached to the bottom of that string? A spoon. A spoon. <laughs> so it was always up there, and if somebody came in, am I right? Yeah. If somebody came in and sat at that stool and ordered coffee, purposely, Pint would not give them a spoon, hoping that they would ask for a spoon. And they had no idea that he'd say, okay, just I'll get you one. He'd go over and lower that string, and that damn spoon would come right down, down, down in the guy's person's coffee. Yeah. There was more than one coffee cup spilled over that spoon. And, of course, us, us native us Not native me. kids just uh -uh. loved it when we could sit there and watch it. Oh, yeah. we knew, I remember that. I never drank that when I was a kid. Yeah, oh, right yeah. into the cup. Oh, it was hilarious. It was. Yeah, I, and I remember 
parents bringing their kids in and sitting them down on the stool oh, sure. for exactly that reason because they wanted the next generation to have the same experience. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the half a cup, Chris? Mm. Well, yeah, it was a cup of mud. And it was it was like this, only it, there was only half of it there. Right. And so you would, they'd say, can I have a half a cup of coffee? And so you'd hand them this half a cup. Yeah. Uh, the other one was there was a cup of mud right out of Chautauqua Lake because some yeah. people would come in and order a cup of mud. Mm -hmm. Out with that cup and look down in there and it was probably taken right out of the lake right down there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then he had a bunch of wooden nickels. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. That said uh, round to it uh, on it. And so when someone would say, when you get around to it, I would just hand them the round to it. Oh, I remember that stuff. I remember uh -huh. a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mom, do you remember um, back in the earlier days when Grandpa Leon was still alive, on Sunday nights um, when everyone was in here to have their uh, ice cream and, and shakes in the evening, 10 o'clock was closing time. And my grandfather and my dad used to come out in a night shirt with a nightcap and a candle to indicate it was time for everyone to go to bed. I don't remember that. Uh -huh. yeah. we, have a, we have a picture of that. So apparently on Sunday nights, that was the, uh, That's closing. That was the closing, closing cue. Time. Well, you have to have a sense of humor, I guess, to be in it. Oh, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I've always said oh, I, boy. The, the business we have, oh, they'll yeah. enjoy. Love. Well, Bite was a good promoter. Yes. He, he was. really had the personality. He to did. Do it. Yeah. I remember Paul. Yeah. But he, I, he seemed to be in the kitchen a lot. Yeah. Yeah. He, his personality was a, a, quite different than what Pint's was. The point was. I was all business. Well, he was. He was. He promoted the business. Oh, yes. And Paul, was, Paul, I guess, was doing or doing the cooking. Yeah. Do you remember um, Aunt Joanna? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. I remember um, my dad would take like a plate of pancakes, and it would be for the person at the other end of the counter. And my Aunt Jo would stand at the other end, and he would sling it down the counter. <laughs> She'd stop it and put it right in front of the person. <laughs> Oh, you remember that? Oh, okay. gosh, yes. Oh. And that was something that every person who was invited to come to that table would get it, you know. <laughs> and uh, when the, when they came in, they would say, oh, gosh, can we sit, can we sit there, can we sit there? <laughs> and I, I know a lot of kids, Mom, who, who love to come in because you would make them special pancakes. Oh, yeah. And they did that for your grandchildren uh, a lot, I remember. Yeah. Uh, it, no, it was your, yeah, your children. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Your children. Uh, Jill and Kurt. Kurt. Yeah. Because um, they were little when I, I was just a few years older than them, and I was waitressing by then. Yeah. I started waitressing when I was 12. Yeah. And uh, so people would come in and ask for special pancakes. So, Mom, do you remember what you used to do to make special pancakes? Oh gosh! Did you did you make um like uh make Mickey Mouse faces and did you put raisins and oh, chocolate yes. chips and yes. cherries yes. and things mm -hmm. like that in it? So when the pancakes came out, you know they were always special and and the kids absolutely loved them. Yeah. So there are, there's you know a couple of generations of kids who like. I figured they'd have chocolate. Yeah. You can't resist chocolate. You can't resist chocolate either. Who okay. can? <laughs> yeah, because when you picked out those cookies, yeah, they, had that's to right. have, they had to have chocolate in them. See, there's chocolate there. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Did you play the piano in yes. here? Yeah, uh, right at the, by the counter. It was in two different spots. It was by the middle window at one time, then it was over by the, the, uh, over by the counter. Right. At the end of the counter. Right. And I used to come in and, uh, oh gosh, I waited over there across the street and they go, well, there's not that many kids going in there yet. I'm going to wait a little bit more. Okay, there's enough. So I come <laughs> over here. I didn't know what I was doing really. You know, uh, did, did you take lessons? Oh, three and a half years. Oh. Yeah. Who was your team? Irene Baker. Yeah. But it was really, really something to come in here and, and really, uh, 
we'll play the piano for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is open, uh, a pan. That all of us should have tightly in your mind mm -hmm. because those are beautiful times. Lake at 10 years old with Spike Keller House, who ran the, the business in front of the Lenhart, and business became very good, so he bought another cruiser, a 26-foot boat, and incidentally, it was made in Falconer, New York. Does anybody remember there's a Chris Craft plant in Falconer? This was a brand new boat. And guess who operated and ran that boat as a muskie guide? Norma Kelder House, oh, Spike's right. wife. Right. So my job was to go with her and either drive the boat when we're out in the lake or check the lines for customers. Ideally, there were four fishermen at a time because there were two what they call outriggers, lines that went this way off the perpendicular to the boat and two that went to the back. So there were a lot of weeds in those days and we knew that there were muscle around the weeds so there was a lot of lines to check and that went on for about four years and um, Spike came down to the dock one morning. We would get there at eight. The boat would leave at nine but we'd get the boats ready and he'd say Bruce, he said, uh, Norma's not feeling well this morning. Well, little did I know why. It was child number five or six that was <laughs> causing her to have to stay home. But in any event, he said, there's one man um, that she was going to take out. And he said, you're going to do that. 14 years old. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm, I'm a musky guy, not just a, a, a hand. <laughs> and ironically, if anybody can remember up around Bemis Bay, getting going toward Long Point, there was some nice big houses up on the hill there. And the line went out. Uh, my, started into a rock area up there, and we knew that. It wasn't, it was a 51-inch muscle lunge. Wow. Oh At 14 years old, I had caught a man, and he was in his 60s in those days, but it was he and I and a muscle lunge and four lines in a boat. <laughs> Where do you go? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, you got him in, though. Got him, got him in, yeah. Oh. Yeah, and, the, and yeah. the guy took it home and was, was going to have it mounted. I never saw the the fish after that, but... Uh, no picture or anything? Pardon? No picture? No, there may have been pictures, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, but um, it was quite an experience. Yeah. Uh, I guess it, so. How many years did you work with Spike? Off and on for probably uh, 20. But it was after I was even married and had children, it was a little supplement on the weekends, not during the week, but on the weekends to help the, the family cause a little bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was quite a, quite a... But it was very enjoyable. It was outdoor work. A bad day on the lake is, is better than any place else. Yes, you've got that right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this has been fun. Oh. <laughs> So that's my, coming back in, that's in my my legend mind. of musky fishing, but <laughs> we did, and I'm not bragging even to this day, but we did catch a lot of fish. But you have to stop to realize, too, that when you're out there every day, now this is before I went part-time, every day in what we call pounded the waters, sooner or later you're going to catch a fish. And the more time you spend it put in, the greater your chances yeah. were. So Spike and I did catch a lot of fish. Do you remember 
remember that you and Dad used to um, do fishing licenses here? Every day. Yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. And we would open up in June, or May, I think it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just can't remember that. No. Yeah. See, that's a problem, our minds. Yeah. But. I remember getting licenses. You could get licenses. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They had a little desk over uh, to the right of the door over there, and uh, we opened usually at 6, but 5 o'clock in the summer, and I can remember my dad nudging me out of bed before 5 o'clock because there were already fishermen lined up to get their fishing licenses for the weekend and go on down, unlock the door, uh, start the coffee, and he'll be down in a few minutes. You know why that was, Sally? Why? Because the fish were biting. Yes, of They'll course. They'll to get there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yep. That yeah. goes on today. And then um, just a couple doors down uh, was a bait shop. Yep. And so, you know, that's where can we get bait? Uh, We'd always send them right down there to get mm -hmm. the bait. Who had that? Uh, and then if they were looking for a guide, of mm -hmm. course, we'd send them to Spike. Um, and Spike was the master of ceremonies at my, my parents' wedding. And he was a fixture here. He, I can remember him in this restaurant, like, uh, you know, a piece of furniture. I mean, he belonged here. He was here all the time. Um, so uh, he would tell us lots of fish tales. But I can remember um, the fishermen would bring the, the fish in and uh, ask us if we'd put them in the freezer. Now, the, I don't think the health department would smile on that these days. But we used to wrap it in newspaper and put it in the freezer for them. Until they were ready to go home. Oh my. Yeah. Well, you're right. Yeah. Do that today. yeah, I couldn't do that today. Yeah. And there's one story, Mom, I remember you telling about um, Ed Pond's wife. Uh, she had heard a story that if you took a lure and smeared it with red lipstick, that you could catch a fish. Do you remember that? So she came in the restaurant and she told all the men she was going to put red lipstick on this lure and she was going to take it out and she was going to be back within an hour with a fish. And her husband Ed and all of the men sitting in this restaurant laughed at her. And so then my mom said they went out fishing and within an hour they were back and she had a big muska lunge and the men didn't laugh at her anymore. <laughs> Mm. They were from Sagerstown, and they came every summer and spent a month in one of our cabins. Oh, yes. great. Well, so a lot of good memories. A yeah. lot of good memories yeah. that we had. At well, thank, thank you. Sure. And thank you to Sarah and Karen, yeah. Bill, yeah. and you. Bruce, and May Brett. <laughs> thank you. Well, we, we had the love yeah. of each person, mm -hmm. and that's what we found and, and did with.